again Ruby, Sigrid and Agnes. I hope you enjoyed Grandad's reading of the last chapter in Sophie's Tom. Well today it's the final chapter in the book. Gosh, we've got through it very quickly, haven't we? And this chapter is called In Which Sophie Gets a Surprise. Oh, I wonder what that might be. Let's find out. The twins' eighth birthday fell in late April and Sophie was busy thinking what to get them. It's difficult, you see, she said to Tom the cat, to know whether to buy them the same thing, which is a bit boring, or different things, when one might like his present more than the other. She stroked the fat black stomach. Can you see Sophie on the uh, chair and uh, Tom on the floor enjoying being stroked? What do you think, she said. But Tom just purred. She sought her father's opinion. I should ask them what they want, he said. So she did. What would you like for your birthday, Matthew? She said to her elder brother. A remote control model car, he said. And I want one too, said Mark. Oh, said Sophie. What kind? A Lamborghini, <coughs> said Matthew. A June buggy, said Mark. Oh, said Sophie. How much do they cost, she said. Oh, about 50 pounds, they said. But 50 pounds for two? No, 50 pounds each. Oh, said Sophie. She took her farm money out of her piggy bank. Do you remember that? She's saving up for a farm. There was Aunt Al's five pound note and quite a lot of coins that she had saved. She sought her mother's help in counting them. Well, said her mother, you've got 47 pence there. So that's five pounds and 47 pence all together. Mm. I don't think I can afford the sort of things the twin want, twins want for their birthday, she said to Tom later. Yeah. I suppose I could cut the five pound note in half. Yeah. Sophie rather agreed with Tom. She was not mean by nature, but that would have been over generous. You're right, Tom. It'll have to be the 47p. And it'll have to be sweets as usual. They like sweets though. So next time they went shopping, she told her mother that she was going to spend 47p that she'd saved up buying sweets for the twins' birthday present. In the shop, almost the first things to catch Sophie's eye were chocolate pennies. You may have seen those at Christmas time in your stocking, if you remember when you were at Grandma's house. How much are those, Mummy? She said. Her mother looked. Oh, a penny each. So I could buy 47 of them. Yes, you could. So she did. Afterwards, she said, Mummy, what's half 47? Right, let's see. It's 23 and a half P. Only there aren't any half pennies anymore. If you want to split it, it will be 24 P and 23 P. Oh, blow, said Sophie. That's no good. They must have exactly the same number of chocolate pennies. Take one away, said her mother, then there'll be 23 for Matthew, 23 for Mark. Take one away, what shall I do with it? Open your eyes and sh open your mouth and shut your eyes and I'll give you something nice, said her mother. And she popped the one chocolate coin left over into Sophie's mouth. After carefully dividing the coin pennies into two heaps, she could count to 23 now, she was getting good at maths. Sophie had then put each heap into a little cardboard box and written the twins' names on them and then put love from Sophie. There they are, see? Two boxes. One St. Mark, one St. Matthew. The boxes were part of a store that she kept in the potting shed, but Matthew and Mark were not aware that they'd once been, that they'd once been used for keeping black beetles in because now they had chocolate pennies in instead. When the day came, they were delighted with Sophie's presents. Gosh, thanks, Sophie, they said. That's all right. Must have cost you an awful lot, they said. It did. 47p, she said. By chance, the birthday was on a Sunday, which meant that the children's father was at home, and what's more, it was a beautiful sunny spring day. 
Matthew and Mark had each been allowed to ask three friends to tea, so they chose six boys with whom they regularly played football. Would you like to ask someone, Sophie? Her mother said. Mark said, what about Darling Dawn? And Matthew said, or oh, Dearest Duncan? Yuck, said Sophie. No thanks, I'll just have my friend Tom. You give that cat too much food, her father said. He's as fat as butter and he needs to take more exercise. Which reminds me, boys, do you want to have the Olympic Games again? Oh yes, please, Dad, they cried. The previous year, their father, who was keen on that sort of thing, had organised all sorts of running and jumping and throwing competitions for the boys' birthday. And they called them the Olympic Games. There were races, short ones across the lawn and long ones right round the garden and a high jump and a long jump and throwing the discus, which was a tin plate, and tossing the cable, which was a clothes prop, and putting the shot, which was a brick. So this year they did the same. And one or two of the twins who were good at that sort of, sorry, one or other of the twins who were good at that sort of thing, won nearly everything or else dead heated for first place. So they had a very enjoyable birthday party. Sophie went in for every event as well and was always last because she was very much the smallest. But everyone cheered her for her determination. And in the last race of all, the marathon, everyone had to run six times around the garden. While Sophie, because she was a lot younger, was allowed to run only three times. And, amazingly, she won. And then they all ate, ate an enormous tea. After all the guests had gone, Sophie plodded upstairs to play with her farm before bedtime. It had grown quite a bit since Christmas, for Sophie had either bought or been given a number of new animals, including a goat, some cheese and a good few more cows. So big was the farm set now that she had been allowed the use of the attic room at the top of the house, so that the farm could be permanently laid out there on the floor, and she enjoyed playing with it a lot. In the attic were some old bits of furniture and various ornaments, and there was even an off-cut of carpet, grassy green in colour, on which the animals stood or lay or grazed. And there's a little picture of them there. In the attic, there's the farm with Sophie and Tom. Sophie knelt on the floor and the black cat purred at her side. With one hand she stroked him and with the other she began to move the dairy herd around the farm. Time for milking, she said. Time for bed, said her father's voice. He came in and sat down in the broken armchair. Come on, my old farmer, he said. You must be tired, especially after winning a marathon. In a minute, Daddy, I've got to get the cows in first. She began to use both hands to pick them up and Tom, released, jumped onto her father's lap. To Sophie's amazement, Tom was not only allowed to remain there, but she saw her father was actually stroking him. Daddy, she said, I thought you didn't like cats. I don't, he said, except this one. I've got used to him, I suppose. You're a good boy, Tom, aren't you? Meow, said the black cat. Oh, yes, you are. Come on, Sophie, love, Betty buys. As soon as Sophie woke the next morning, she felt that something was a little bit different. What? Oh yes, there was no black hot water bottle on her feet. She got dressed and went out to see her flocks and herds in the potting shed, but there was no sign of Tom there or anywhere in the garden. And stranger still, he did not appear at breakfast time, which was when Sophie usually fed in. Oh, look, he hasn't disappeared again. By the time she finished eating, Sophie was becoming rather worried. Though she didn't say anything to the others. She plodded upstairs to the attic room to do the morning milking. As she neared the door, she suddenly heard some faint little squeaks. They seemed to be coming from the old armchair. Sophie went to have a look in it. And then she gave a cry of, yikes, in the chair snuggling against the now much smaller stomach of Tom were four little furry bodies. One was Tabby, one was Tortoiseshell, one was Black with a white bib and white feet and the other was coal black just like its mother. Oh 
Tom, Sophie said. How clever you are, my dear. And all this time I thought you were a boy. But ever am I going to call you now? But the only answer was a loud, proud purr of contentment from Sophie's tongue. So I'll have to wait till the next series book to see if they do think of a new name for Tom. In the meantime, I'll leave you with a lovely picture of Tom and her four kittens. And I will say bye-bye. See you next time.